I know from our viewers at Kiko, there's a lot of frustration right now in the gold space in regards to prices, and people are just really uh, waiting for a breakout here. So I hope we can tackle uh, you know, some of these issues. Gold has really not managed to break uh, beyond 1400 here. So what is it going to take to get out of this range? Doug? The easy question to answer, sure. right? Right. Where, where's the gold price going? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, actually, the gold price has, I think, done well over the last several years. You know, we've had a nice progression. Um, despite what's going on in the overall markets, uh, gold is, is doing what it's supposed to do. It's rising. Um, volatility is down in the gold space, um, and perhaps that's frustrating for many. If you look at uh, the gold price, it's really set by the COMEX traders, and they, they are using gold for a variety of different reasons, liquidity, hedge strategies, and, and whatnot. But, um, you know, clearly the gold price is on the rise, and I, and I think the challenge is really to get through 1370, mm -hmm. and then we can get into the $1,400 uh, price level. And, and I level. think that's a good point, because I think we, we tend to forget the days of, you know, before $1,000 gold. So, uh, Jane, I see you grabbing the mic. Do you have any yeah, thoughts on that? I was just going to add that um, I agree that gold is, has held in there, especially above 1300 despite now a rising dollar. We'll see where that goes. Um, but I think the precious metal space overall remains quite depressed with stocks overall doing poorly, um, silver underperforming. So I think I agree with, with you, Doug, that, that we've, we've already bounced maybe five or six times against 1360 or 1370. And, and that's, that's the, the resistance we need to break through to see a, a really good return. But I think one thing that's been surprising on the posi positive side, not only that gold is held above 1300, but that it did not go down in March and April, which we often see. So I thought that was quite encouraging this year. Why do you think it was able to, to resist that? Um, I think a lot of it was mainly ETF buying. Mm -hmm. um, ETF holdings globally have been climbing very steadily for quite some time. Um, so if you look at just the chart of overall ETF holdings globally, there's a Bloomberg ticker for that, um, you can see that it's been climbing very steadily. So that, that's highly correlated. The ETF holdings is highly correlated with the price of gold. And, and that's a really good point. Yet we're not seeing that on the physical buying though, right? At least in North America, has anyone? Ian? Um, well, that's not good. I believe so. Is that better? Yeah. Um, what you're seeing right now in the gold and silver space is complete and utter investor disinterest in the entire sector. Um, if you look back to 2016, when uh, a lot of people made a lot of money in this sector, um, there was quite intense activity, um, what you're seeing now is nothing. And the investors seem a lot more interested in buying tech shares or various other forms of investment. And um, until we start to see some breakout in the price uh, of gold and silver, um, we suspect investor disinterest will just remain. People have been burnt so many times in this sector that they want to see, uh, they want to see sustained evidence that the price is going up before they want to get involved again, I think. So you think that the crypto play has taken some of that thunder away from, from gold? No, I think it's, uh, if you look at the investors scene, I think the, a lot of the, uh, want to call speculators or investors, private, private investors and institutional, um, are more and more concentrated in tech stocks now. Than the, you, 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 you've got all, if you look at the S&P, uh, sorry to diverge a little bit. If you look at the S&P as a ratio of US GDP, it's, it's, it's Warren Buffett's favourite measure. It's at all, almost mm -hmm. at an all-time high. And, you, and one of the uh, signs you look for for a top in the market is more and more concentration into fewer and fewer stocks, which is exactly what you're seeing right now. Loads of people all in Google and Amazon and all these stocks. Um, so you're, you, you're putting in place... Uh, all the conditions are there for a quite a major setback in uh, general equities. Um, yet Jamie Dimon yesterday saying uh, ten-year treasuries are going to go from three percent to four percent. Well, if he's right, and I think he probably is, um, everybody today who sit their own treasury bonds is going to lose money. So if you're going to lose money in equities and you're going to lose money in bonds, people are going to start to look for other things to invest in, um, and that's when we think the catalyst will be to return some interest to this sector. But all the time, people are making more money in other sectors. They're probably this disinterest is probably going to stay. 
Good point. Vince? Uh, to the, the, the points about uh, you know, cryptos, uh, uh, stealing gold thunder and what have you, uh, I agree with you. That's not the case. If you look at the markets, the, the, the physical bullion market is $3 billion or $3 trillion, I'm sorry, and uh, to own it, uh, derivatives notwithstanding. Uh, the equity markets are about $700 trillion, and, and the, the crypto market is about uh, you know, a billion dollars, $700 uh, million. The, the, the point is that the headlines may be being stolen, but it's not competing with gold, although the, the, the marketing uh, of the mainstream media would have you believe otherwise. And uh, to, to your point about uh, gold uh, making lows in March and April, there is a seasonality in gold that it does frequently make lows in, in the March, April time. And that would be historically, if you're trading the market, a time to buy uh, uh, for the for at least until August. Uh, unfortunately, and that's the flip side of us not making the low in March and April, we're making it in uh, May, uh, which is uh, disconcerting. Uh, in the short term, but uh, for me, it means nothing in the long term. I hope that adds yeah. to what they're saying. And just to add to that, you know, and I'll ask you this, Chris, is I think this was a news item that got some attention, at least on Kitco, we covered it, but it kind of <laughs> fell below a lot of people's radar. In March, John Paulson's uh, hedge fund removed client capital from its gold fund, essentially closing the fund. Um, do you think this sent an important message to the gold market, or was it? whole hum for you, Chris? Well, I think it's just reinforcing um, what everybody else here on the panel is saying. It's just that there's no interest in, in gold, uh, no interest in, in gold mining right now. And it is what it is. I mean, hopefully it's it's the mark of a low. Um, I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't imagine that if he were getting tons and tons of interest um, from outside investors that he would have said, okay, boys, you know, we're, we're all done. So I, I just think that you know, we're, we're at this phase now in the market where it just seems like malaise has just gone to absolutely a, a, a comatose state, you know, like just tired to almost, oh, to just barely on life support, which is fine because, because, because everybody's waiting around but the gold, for the gold stocks to move and for gold to move, but it's still hanging in there, like despite, um, like, like Shane was saying and Doug was saying, like d despite this, the, the fact that, no one cares. In it's it's still apathy. at thirteen. Yeah, in, in yeah. spite of apathy, it it's exists. still at thirteen. It's still at thirteen twenty or thirteen fifty. Right. So, so we thing. essentially need a rally here to bring excitement back into the space. But if we look at mining stocks, a lot of people would argue, well, this is a fantastic buying opportunity right now. So shouldn't that be creating excitement, Vince? I, uh, I'm a generalist when it comes to mining stocks and uh, others. Can, can speak more to it. I think mining stocks have a couple problems. And uh, if you believe in general that mining stocks are undervalued, I would agree with you. Uh, the question is, how long can you wait for them to be properly valued? You know, if the anchor is the valuation of the stock and the rope is the tether and the price is the boat, the boat never floats over the anchor. And that's because of, uh, and that's voiced in frustrations by Paulson. Uh, 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 exiting the market because, yes, they are undervalued, but where is the catalyst that will get them to where they should be? For some, it's a rally in the price of gold because many of these miners don't hedge properly um, and they want to be a proxy for gold to satisfy investors. For other miners, a rally in gold won't help them because they run their company like a business. And uh, there's lower lying fruit and when people like Paulson pull out of gold, and it may be a low water mark, you know, fingers crossed. Uh, they're triaging to go to their core competencies. And his frustration with mining companies, somewhat warranted and somewhat not warranted, uh, is well known. Uh, I think miners uh, don't get their message out enough uh, mm -hmm. and have, as a result, have been, you know, pushed aside on the mainstream media. I mean, when's the last time you saw a, a miner come up after Maria Bartiroma says something on CNBC? Well, they're not given the chance, maybe. They're not getting booked on the show. Right? Exactly. That's they don't part want to of the pay, problem. Well, they don't want to pay the money right. for so the So mainstream media likes gold when gold's rallying, right? So they don't want to talk to the mining CEO when, when it's just not moving. So They hate it less. Yeah. I think there's another point that many of us are, are well aware of, and that is a change in the structure of asset management than, that itself. And what I mean is this. Alpha is very scarce. 
in asset management, meaning outperforming the markets is very is growingly difficult. I mean, just for broad indices, especially U.S. indices. And so, and because asset managers are evaluated with greater frequency, they used to be evaluated, say, every quarter, every six months, every year. Now they're evaluated on a month-by-month -month basis. So when they think of the prospect of investing in, say, a gold miner, and they see what happens when a gold miner gets it wrong, like Detour recently, like Predium not so recently, um, they, they, want, they, they, they really don't want to roll the dice on gold miners and they're waiting for the industry to gain some traction before trying to take on the risk of buying something that obviously has value. I mean, mining shares are, are incredibly depressed in terms of valuation and yet no one really wants to take the risk right now until we have some clearer signs. Doug? In, in, if I got could add to that. I think that's a good point. I think um, maybe even to the first question of what's keeping gold down is that uh, there's a reluctance to participate in the in the space because of the, you know, the past say seven to ten years of capital destruction. I think if you saw the gold price go to fourteen to fifteen hundred dollars, you'd see a lot more interest. Obviously, you have a rising gold price, but um, I think you know maybe the the more important and point point for the miners is that. They're making money now. This is a decent gold price right. for the miners. And in Australia and Canada, those are good gold prices. There's nothing wrong yeah. with those gold prices, those profits. But they're not outsized type of profits that investors expect from a gold price move. And so we would really need a fourteen to fifteen hundred dollar gold price to get the market, you know, more interested in the equities. Or, or what happened if more gold companies started paying dividends? I think that would certainly help, and I, you're beginning to see that recognized yeah. uh, by the marketplace. Newmont raising their dividend. Right. Um, I talked to a client uh, last week who was very disappointed in the performance uh, of their investment, and they said, "But well, why don't you guys issue dividends at least yeah. as a return?" I said, "Well, that would be nice, but none of the companies we're investing in really have sufficient dividends to share with with our clients, with our investors." So, I think I think. Uh, companies have to recognize they do have to return capital and not just the stock price appreciation. Yeah, that's a good point, Ian. Do you have anything to add there? No, I mean, I think we all seem pretty much in broad agreement, to be honest. The only point I'd add is that uh, during this sort of retrenchment phase, if you want to call it that, a lot of these companies have been getting their act together with uh, cutting down their costs and they're in pretty good shape. I mean, we met recently with a lot of uh, Canadian mining CEOs who came over for the Zurich Gold Show into London and uh, every single one that we met seemed to be in materially better shape than they were a year ago and yet the share prices are lower. Uh, so they feel a bit frustrated. They're not being rewarded for the sort of bits of uh, good work they put in. And also, in the medium-term space where we tend to uh, invest, we don't tend to buy too many exploration shares or the big market caps. Um, they're all spitting off free cash flow. And they're all spitting off free cash flow in quite decent amounts as well. So when we heard earlier that uh, if companies want to do M&A, they've got to do uh, borrow money from the bank or raise it from a royalty company or issue more debt, there's a fourth alternative, which is they start to do it at their own free cash flow. And uh, that's why I think you'll see the M&A uh, kick off in the small to medium sector rather than the big, because uh, they're starting to spit off free cash flow in a way that the... The, the, the sums they're spitting off is not a million miles away from starting to trigger some of this M&A. So it may be always the industry that triggers the first buying in this sector rather than the outside investors. Chris, you're nodding in agreement. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I agree with, again, I, like Ian said, I think we're all in pretty good agreement. I, and with, especially with you know what Doug was saying in terms of, um, yeah, what, once the gold price goes, uh, right now the, the, the stocks that are doing well are stocks like Royal Gold, um, which is generating a lot of free cash flow. It's a low risk investment in the gold mining sector. Um, and, uh, and Newmont is actually doing pretty well because it's generating free cash flow. So I think that once the sto stocks that generate free cash flow are going to do well, it, it was, and kind of to Doug's point is that, if gold goes, th when gold goes through 1400 and they, and they, lots of companies start generating free cash flow, then, then lots of stocks are going to start doing really well. Yeah. The, the, is the same hold true on the silver front? We see a lot of the silver companies like you know, First Majestic beaten down from where they used to be. Uh, is this an opportunity to make money here? I, I think with silver, um, so the, the 
gold to silver ratio uh, is at one of its highest. It's really, really high, whatever, 85 yeah, to 1 now, right? Yeah. And, 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 and the mean is, mm -hmm. say, 70 to 1. Um, I think that, yeah, like, like silver is, my view is that silver is the poor man's gold. It's more of, a, more of a retail kind of instrument, retail in the U.S. And that if gold goes through 1,400, or again, when gold goes through 1,400, I think the silver will catch up pretty quickly. And so, um, it, and that and it, it'll, it'll rev that ratio will revert more towards its mean, and the silver stocks will do well. Yeah. Um, sorry, Vince, did you want to say something on that? Yeah, about silver languishing, as a person who's, uh, I have more history in silver uh, than in gold, actually having taken delivery, it, it seems that the producers uh, or, or the commercials that handle the producer hedging, uh, between 18 and 1850 is where they unload. And that also coincides with the commitment of traders being you know, overtly long on the speculative side. And, and, uh, and you get that cap. I think uh, silver languishing now, uh, I'd hesitate to, to, to put a pin on it, but I think it could be a re, not necessarily bearish for silver, its behavior, but bullish for gold, and by that I mean gold is money. Gold is being remonetized de facto, although not officially. Silver is not. Now, silver can be a proxy for gold, uh, as the ratio suggests, but central banks don't buy silver, they buy gold. And I think, you know, in the worst case scenario, you're seeing gold slowly become uh, remonetized, uh, although it'll never be labeled that way, whereas silver uh, is, an, is, is industrial and is permitted to sink uh, while central banks are accumulating gold. I, silver will track gold if gold rallies, no doubt about that. But you know, I don't know that the ratio is going to hold true.